Hello cave dwellers, welcome back to the cave for what is quite a sad day for me. We've all got our favourite monitors, haven't we? You're probably thinking about yours right now. Well, mine's died as we'll see in a minute, and it was a very special monitor because it was the only one I have that I can use with the Amiga range of computers. We've got the 500 and the 1200 here. Fixing that monitor is of course the ideal solution, but they're not getting any younger and eventually these CRTs will all die out. So in the longer term, I need a solution that will allow me to use the Amigas on something like this modern 15 inch LCD display. But before I drop three figures on an Indivision scan doubler or a Vampire Accelerator card with a built in HDMI port, both perfectly valid solutions, I thought I'd try something a little bit cheaper that might benefit the rest of us with a stock Amiga 500 or 1200 who don't want to spend too much money on being able to play those old games on authentic hardware. Today we'll look at my trials and tribulations of using this solution, warts and all, and there'll be a follow-up episode where we try and solve some of the problems that we come across in case you think the stock solution isn't good enough for you. The reason for that is that the solution can be used on a variety of systems from arcade machines to old Sinclair QLs and the fixes apply to any system that you want to put through it and not just the Amiga range so more people can benefit from a separate episode addressing those problems. But that's enough of my chat, let's take a look at my broken monitor and get stuck into that solution. Here is that monitor then, it's my Philips CM8833 II and it's not just great for the Amiga actually, owing to the number of inputs it has on the back, it's perfect for a whole range of retro systems. It even has built in speakers and a headphone jack on the side. You just don't get monitors with this many options these days. Anyway here's the problem, when I turn it on it makes a sound like this. The problem I suspect is a faulty flyback transformer used to control the horizontal movement of the electron beam in the CRT. I've tried reflowing the solder but it wasn't good enough, it needs replacing. So we'll fix that at some point, but today's question of course is can we cheaply use a modern monitor with an Amiga? Enter the £15 or $21 GBS8220 board. Brother of the GBS8200, the difference primarily being that this gives us two VGA outputs instead of one. Its intended purpose is for use in arcade cabinets as arcade boards tend to output video at a 15kHz horizontal rate, like the Amiga, as opposed to the 31kHz and higher of modern systems. Inputs on the board accept RGB, CGA, EGA and YUV, YUV essentially being S-Video before the connector was standardised, and it outputs to VGA, increasing the scan rate and the resolution to those supported by the modern monitor you're plugging into it. To connect the Amiga, we'll be soldering the included harness cable here to a female DB23 plug for the Amiga's video port. We want the best image we can get so we're avoiding composite or RF outputs. Some soldering is required but it's just 5 cables, RGB, horizontal sync which is grey and ground which is black. Vertical sync, the yellow cable, is not needed here. If we're successful I'll fit a back shell to the connector and wrap the cables but this is fine for testing today. With the board attached to a 5 volt power supply we're ready to go. The Amiga's video port can supply 5 volts but I wouldn't recommend it as the board draws more than 3 times the current that the Amiga is designed to kick out, so stick to an external supply. The onboard menu offers the usual colour, contrast and positioning options, as well as the output resolutions 640x480, 800x600, 1024x768 and 1360x768 all greater than our stock Amiga 500 and 1200 standard resolutions, so upscaling will be taking place as well as that horizontal scan doubling. Let's start with the A500 then. Thankfully we get an image first time. We'll switch to a capture in a moment so ignore the artefacting caused by my camera, but close ups do show a promising start with fairly clean edges and some noise but it's certainly better than an RF modulated output on a TV. Mm. 
Let's jump over to that captured footage. Some adjustment was needed to bring the brightness and contrast up to a usable level. I also found this was the case on a PC CRT which I tried this out with, but we could bring them up to acceptable levels. Now of note is the sharpness setting. This ranges from 1, which really does blur the edges, all the way up to 10 where we can see a lot of noise coming through. The default is 5, which I think is a happy compromise. That noise however, a shape of things to come as you'll see. You're probably also getting annoyed like me at that flashing bar at the bottom of the screen. Thankfully this was an easy fix, I changed the vertical size with the intention of moving it off the bottom of the screen, but actually by setting it back to its original setting it disappeared, so I, I don't quite know how that worked, but problem solved, we like an easy solution. On to some more testing then, and we'll start with the game Lombard RAC Rally. On the first screen here we have some white text on a black background, and it's perfectly readable. There are none of those wavy edges like you have on a television set. It's nice and crisp and I'm quite impressed with that. Going into the gameplay itself, my first impressions were very impressive. We've got a nice steady and stable image here, and on my small monitor sat at a reasonable distance without my nose to the screen. It's perfectly playable and I'm not distracted by any artefacting or problems. However, if we take a closer look, those wavy lines are back that we saw when we turned the sharpness up. There is some kind of distortion or interference that's just coming through here, and it's particularly noticeable on large blocks of colour. We'll switch over to another game now, Eliminator, which was one of the games I had on day one when I first bought my Amiga. The shop threw it in for some reason. Now the interference is a bit more obvious here. Here we are driving on our checkerboard track, and if I just freeze the frame and zoom in a bit, you can see those diagonal distorted effects just coming across the colours there. A more extreme example is as we approach the tunnel here, again I'm just going to freeze it, and you can see on that solid block of colour on the wall, there's a lot of interference happening there. It's also very noticeable on the side walls as we drive through the tunnel. Let's switch over to Workbench now, where we do find that it's perfectly usable. Icons are clear and text is easy to read. We'll pop into Shell here and bring up some text, and it's perfectly usable. Again, much more usable than an RF modulated TV signal or even the composite out. We're definitely sitting on a solution here that's better than a TV, and as I had a TV originally on the Amiga, that's kind of what I grew up with, so it is a step up from those memories, but having used a monitor on it more recently, we haven't quite got the crisp finish that we had on that, and those distortion effects do come through again on the solid grey blocks of colour. But do let's stop to remind ourselves this is a £15 or $20 solution. Considering the price of it, I am incredibly impressed with what I'm seeing here, as well as the convenience it now offers me in using my Amiga. This is not to be easily dismissed. I've set our board now to run at a 1024 by 768 resolution, and just look at this. We do have that noise in the background, but notice the white spots now, there's a sparkly effect that's coming across the screen. This isn't a problem for me, because I will be using my monitor at 640x480, it's only a 15 inch screen, so that's fine. But there's a link in the description to Ian Steadman's blog. He's had his scope out and he believes he's found the source of the problem. The SD RAM on the board seems to be running a little too quickly for its own good, and by stepping the speed of that RAM down he's eliminated this effect altogether. So if that's something you need to solve for a larger monitor, then go and check that link and read up on how he's worked his way around that. Back at 640x480 now, and if we put the Amiga 1200 into an interlaced graphics mode, it does a fine job of deinterlacing it and upscaling it here. There's none of that eye strain that you would associate with an interlaced mode on a television set. I find it quite usable, although the standard high res mode on the 1200 is fine for the kind of tasks that I perform. I'm mainly a gamer on these machines. Here are some final examples for you then on the 1200 of what it looks like sat back where I would sit when I'm using the machine, and you can see it's quite usable, I'd be quite happy working on this machine all day long. And then a close up of a scene that was particularly badly affected by artefacting, 
and what it would look like if you really got your nose up close to the screen. You can see that interference on the red background coming through there. So that is the GBS 8220 on the Amiga in its stock state. What conclusions can we draw from this then? So we'll bring our episode to a close there then. That's the stock solution complete with problems. We saw those wavy lines and at higher resolutions those sparkles on the screen, which aren't a problem for me on my small monitor. But if you want to use those higher resolutions on a large television or a larger monitor, then I think those white dots are going to annoy you. So we'll look at those problems in the follow-up episode very soon. I'm not the first to look at this board. I've added some links in the description to other YouTubers who have played with this board and played with a variety of solutions. What I would say is if you're going to use this with an Amiga, there is one modification that you should make quite urgently, if not immediately. And that's to add a resistor to the C-Sync cable um, because on the Amiga it works at 5 volts and the rating for the chip on this board is only 3.3 volts so you're actually running a C-Sync higher than it's really rated for and in the longer term that could cause reliability problems. We'll make that modification in the next episode but you should really be aware of that. As always thank you for watching I hope this has helped some of you out there and I'll see you in the next episode. Take care.